I mean, with all the reading, yeah. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, if you're an MPA or MS in leadership student, um, be sure that you sign in to the sign-up sheet because there's a special announcement that goes with that, which I'll make in a little while. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, ninth version of the fall reception and colloquium, and it's, I can't believe there are none that we've done. So we're closing in on a decade. And I think it's been very special, the programs that we've been able to do. And I think you're going to find that tonight is, is no different. And if you have not got already gotten some refreshments, uh, please help yourself. And our own Mr. Boschman is doing double duty tonight. Of course, he is TIP certified, <laughs> as well as being certifiable. Uh, but he has beverages of the adult variety, as you can see. And there's a charge for that, I'm sure, Mr. Boschman. Is that correct? No, no charge. There's no charge. That's quite remarkable. Well, there you go. So uh, there you have it. Um, naturally, uh, putting together one of these is a team effort. It requires a lot of help. And first of all, I'd like to thank, um, and no, this is no particular order, certainly not priority order, but thank Europe for allowing us to come back this year with a wonderful program we had last year. At, facility, as you see, is quite uh, nice, and we have the spectacular view of Providence, and we owe Mr. Boschman a uh, debt of gratitude for assisting in that regard. <coughs> He's been the liaison here, so both Europe and Mr. Boschman deserve some kudos. Um, but it doesn't end with that. Uh, Dr. Norvell has done a yeoman's job here in pulling, pulling together the last minute stuff. And Dean Manzi, of course, is always in her supportive role. We're very appreciative of that. And then, of course, we come to the person who is primarily responsible for this thing, and it's Jane Flora. And Mrs. Flora is in the back. Without her, we're at the first annual. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't any more. So she is just an incredible um, resource, and uh, I can't thank her nearly enough. Um, I don't know if you're all aware, but Mrs. Flora is leaving us and uh, going to Virginia. And uh, she's shown me the photos, and it's quite a spectacular. It's not Terra, but it's it's getting close. The uh, her place sits up on a hill. You can see the river in front. It's green. Um, I accused her of putting going to a studio and making the picture, but she assures me it's real. <laughs> um, so it's quite nice there, and uh, she and her husband are going there very shortly, and we want to wish her the very best. Um, I don't think I'm letting anything out of the bag here, am I, that we're doing an event for her tomorrow? A luncheon for Mrs. Flora? She knows. She knows. <laughs> I knew she knew. I mean, she knows everything. You can't hide anything from her. Uh, but uh, we're starting approximately noon, and you are, are all welcome to, uh, to join us and say farewell to Mrs. Flora. So thank you if you're able to come. Um, tonight is also the night that we start uh, recognizing some important academic achievements and the first is to recognize uh, the Dean's Award winner for Outstanding Graduate in the Masters in Leadership program. Uh, the battle for supremacy was a tie and so there are actually two winners of that award. Charles DeSantis right here with us, Mr. Sons, would you come up front? And uh, Jen Rajat is not with us this evening yet. He's supposed to be. He's, I thought he was he too. Told he would be. <laughs> well, um, if he's delayed, we'll be sure to make sure he gets it in the mail. Or however. So, Mrs. Flora, would you and Dean Manzi join us to Dean Manzi, would you? <laughs> I'm very pleased to be involved with this. Well, congratulations, Sean. Don't tell him the story, you tell him. Here, say a few words. For a few words, uh, I will tell you that the Masters of Leadership program 
when I was still in the Navy, uh, I was looking for a degree, did a lot of research, and found this program through Roger Williams University, and it really struck a chord with me. And from my very first class until my last class, I will tell you that the opportunity to use what was in the classroom went directly back to where I worked as the director of the Navy Senior Enlisted Academy. And there are some courses, the leadership design is one, communication is one, the diversity, and probably the most dangerous to make me better at was the negotiation uh, <laughs> course. And I think there's a fine line between negotiation and manipulation. Uh, so with those skills from that course, I was able to negotiate a much better outcome for our academy at the, down in Newport uh, than without those skills. So please, it's not a grade. It it's really is your future. Uh, get, take as much out of these classes as you can because you will use it later on, if not already. Thank you. Uh, we also have an award for the outstanding graduate in the MPA. And uh, the gentleman who is uh, the awardee took my advice, which many students don't. <laughs> he um, has a family, um, full-time job, all kinds of other responsibilities, and so I told him, do yourself a giant favor and take one course a semester. And he, like so many others who've heard that advice, said, that'll be so long. Now, when he got to PA 599, which is the capstone uh, data gathering portion of the two-course capstone sequence, he came to the office, and you know what he said to me? His first words were, I can't believe it's over. <laughs> so even if you take it one course at a time and save your GPA, it'll be over before you know it. So, Paul Shanley. first things that stuck in my mind about public administration was one of the lectures of Dr. Hall when he talked about high performing organizations who encourage their employees to be a life -long <coughs> I don't know if you remember that lecture but that really stuck with me the importance of education and what the master's program has done for me in my life I took a 25 year break from the time I got my undergraduate degree to my graduate degree and I debated on whether to get a degree in criminal justice or public administration. And when I looked at the curriculum, hands down, it was public administration. And as the speaker before me said, this is something I've used in my position as deputy chief of police at Brown University. And I know many of you are here, you may be thinking you can get ahead and work with this, and that's right, but I always, always, I want you to think that you should be here for yourself. And always strive to learn and be the best you can at what you do. And I think for me, when I graduated, it was one of the biggest accomplishments of my life. And I, I can't thank Dr. Hall enough for being there to support and Jean and everyone in the program. And also, along the way, I got to meet some great people, which I hope you do, that were there to help me in my endeavor in class. So remember, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So learn as much as you can, and you can certainly take this information and get far, far ahead of many people. And, I, and just for being in class and working full time, I admire you and I say that to everyone. Every one of the students in here has already exhibited something better by demonstrating that they want to learn. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, these three uh, award winners uh, took everything that Dean Manzi, Dr. Norvell, myself, and Mrs. Flora through at them. So if um, they can persevere and do it, I think they're role models for us all. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Master's in Public Administration and Master's of Science and Leadership programs, uh, along with Rye Aspa, have over the years worked with the Pawtucket schools and their two uh, academies, uh, one at Shea High School, which is the Government and Public Service Academy. It's the only one in the United States and the Tolman Law and Public Safety Academy. Unfortunately, the representatives of those two 
academies and the school districts were otherwise uh, occupied this evening. I take that back. I didn't see him come in. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Souza, Chris Souza. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for coming. Um, as, I'm, as I'm sure our keynoter will also tell you, uh, being a classroom teacher <coughs> in 2015 is like going to work in a fire hazard location. So please uh, keep in mind our school teachers, uh, Mr. Souza does a wonderful job. And I have had the privilege of going into his classroom and seeing his kids. And over the years, I've given, I've, I go in there and give them stuff to do. Um, because part of what happens is if they do it, they become eligible for three college credits from Roger Williams University, which are transferable else elsewhere. Um, but also, uh, they become members of the Rhode Island chapter of ASPA and National ASPA, and they're the only high school students in the entire nation who are members of ASPA. So um, I've given them a lot of weird stuff to do, they thought, I think. I had them do videos once, and we had public service messages. I've had them do SketchUp with Mr. Boschman, a software package that allows them to do 3D reimaginings of buildings such as their classroom, and they have never disappointed. And some of them have gone on to rather distinguished educational careers. Um, one young lady's at uh, Georgetown University on a full scholarship. So these are people who have overcome some significant um, obstacles and if you really want to find out about them and the story that uh, goes with Mr. Souza and all the schools, may I invite you to uh, look at the fall issue of Pub Teaching Public Administration in which you will find an article that I put together uh, telling the story and um, Teaching Public Administration in international terms so there will be people throughout the United States as well as Western Europe and even Asia who will see that story and it is a story to be proud of. Unfortunately also Mr. Pascarella of our university, Roger Williams, is not available but Mr. Pascarella has been instrumental in putting together these programs um, and I know that Dean Manzi will join me in the accolades that I give to, uh, to uh, Mr. Pascarella. He's just been, he's a wonderful colleague. He, he himself was a long-term uh, public school teacher here in Rhode Island. So. He knows how to put together sound programs, and he's a pleasure to work for. And he kids me about Oklahoma football, particularly <laughs> when he moves, as was the case last weekend. I'm sorry to report. Now, um, Rye ASPA is a uh, part of the larger National ASPA Association. Uh, if you're not a member, Mrs. Flora has membership applications, and she will be happy to take any money that you'd like to send in for your student membership, which is a minimum, I think, 50, 40 bucks? 40. Okay. Um, or you can apply online. And we held RIASPA elections this past September. And the ballots were done on paper, in secret. No human hands other than Mrs. Flora has touched them. And while she's not Price Waterhouse, she is trustworthy in counting them. Mrs. Flora, could you share with us the results? Drum roll, please. <laughs> um, so I received 18 ballots. And um, along with the two names, Dr. Hall and Dr. Norbell, Vice President for Dr. Norbell, President for Dr. Hall. There was a line where you could write in if you preferred somebody, you wanted to vote for somebody else for President, Vice President. Nobody did that. So there were 18 ballots, and so I got 18 votes for Dr. Hall for President and 18 votes for Dr. Norbell. But more important was to get a strong board um, to take over and to move forward for the club, the organization. And so what I did is I, I took all the ballots and I found those that got the most votes. I took the top five. Um, the top five 
uh, is William White, uh, Karen L. Ramirez, she's not here tonight, Sasha Zapata, uh, Chantal Bima, and George Labonte. Um, I got additional votes, and so I thought, well, I think we need all alternates. Not everybody can come every night. Um, I think a bigger group probably gives a stronger um, uh, group of members who can have diverse ideas and, you know, can move things along and not overwhelm a few people. So alternates receiving two votes um, was Paul Johnston, Brian Chacon, uh, Vicki Walters, and Michael O'Brien. Um, it doesn't mean that, you, you know, you can say that you don't want to be on the board, that's fine. Um, I don't think being on the board, being the top five or the alternates, I think you really are just all board members and I think you can all work together and find a future for the program, for the organization. Thank you, Mrs. Flora, and thank you to all the winners. Um, in addition to that election, there's another one for ASPA coming in November, and that's for the National Council. My term ended um, in March at the Chicago meeting, but apparently they thought enough of the work I did with them that they encouraged me to uh, run again. So uh, that election is being held in November. If you are a member of ASPA and live in and work in District 1, which is us, from New England to New York, um, I would encourage you to participate and I would appreciate your vote. So um, that gives us a voice on the council that very few other chapters get. And speaking of voices, Dr. Norvell will be going to uh, Washington, D.C. in November, November 7th. She's going to be taking my place. I have a trip planned that can't be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> But in taking my place, she's going to be presenting to other chapter members, other chapter officers from around the nation, as well as the National Council, the executives um, of ASPA, all the staff, um, and the elected officials of, of ASPA, president, vice president, and so on. And importantly, the topic is taking your chapter to the next level. Now, Dr. Norvell and I have been discussing this, and until recently, we weren't, allowed, we weren't aware that we were at another level, but apparently we are. And that's what she's going to talk about, how we got there, I guess. Now, part of that has to do with, we've had the last, Mrs. Flora, the last five ASPA presidents, Yes. The last five national ASPA presidents come to our May conference. Mm -hmm. Dean Manzi has been uh, able to meet some of them, as well as the vice president and the current president, was the vice president, um, female. <coughs> the incoming president, who is currently vice president, female. So we had a uh, diverse and um, representative group. If you're not a member of ASPA, may I encourage you to be part of it. I think it's an important part of your professional development, and it puts another line on your resume. Now, in regard to at RIASPA, you were asked this morning or this evening to sign in. There's a reason for that. First, we want to know who you are and say hello. But um, our own uh, Vicki Walters and Sasha Zapata Ladies, would you stand to be recognized? They joined our program in uh, the spring of this year, but have become leaders. And they, um, how shall we put this, Ms. Zapata, Ms. Walters? It was our own negotiation class. It was. <laughs> it was. And the negotiation was over extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on there, Ms. Schwartz. <laughs> um, and I said, 
how much? And they said 20 points. <laughs> I said more well, like one, and they said, uh, how about five? I said two and a half. <laughs> so we went back and forth, but I said, here's what's got to happen. You've got to show up not only tonight, but you also have to find out who's going to be here and be in charge of who's going to be here when they sign in. Because what I'm going to ask you also to do is be part of the May conference and create a panel and be part of that conference and impress the people who are coming from National Aspen yet again. So there's extra credit available for my classes. Dr. Norvell has agreed, perhaps under some duress, <laughs> <laughs> to provide extra credit. Um, yes, a negotiation, a very strenuous negotiation. But you also have to take part in the spring. So if you want extra credit, I think we can work on that, but we will need your efforts. So um, those who were elected to the council, Friaspa Council, um, would be some of the folks to take the lead, uh, but I don't want them to do it alone. And I know that you're all creative. And when those people from New York or from, uh, where are they coming from? Washington, <laughs> show up, I want you to show them that we've taken Friaspa to the next level. And Mrs. Flora, I don't understand Professor your code. Ford also. Professor Ford's 513. Did you get roped into it also? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ford, thank you so much. <laughs> we welcome your participation, certainly. Um, and the May event is a uh, Wednesday, and I believe it's May 4. So mark that on your calendar. Now, we turn to tonight's feature presentation. Um, we have tonight a very distinguished young woman um, who has kindly accepted my challenge to talk about our program theme this year. Along with the academies, RIASPA, the membership of um, programs and, and the faculty uh, at Roger Williams, we try to develop a theme each year. This year the theme is working with people in crisis and I think tonight's keynote is a wonderful example of exactly the kinds of crises that are faced by many, many people. And um, when I first met her and I talked to her about doing this, my first question to her was, do you work with people in crisis? And her response was, every day. And we were just commiserating before. It may not only be just every day, but every hour, and probably every minute of every hour. So this is the lady who knows her business. Um, she has worked in the community in a number of capacities. Um, and Ms. Cipriani, you will be interested to know that she has worked with the Latina Leadership Institute. Our own Ms. Cipriani is finishing her capstone and she's using the Latina Leadership Institute as her area of work. Um, our keynoter has uh, graduated magna cum laude and she does the kind of resource work that Rye Aspa can benefit from. Ladies and gentlemen, Join me in welcoming Doris De Los Santos. I would like to thank especially Jane Flora, what is Jane, for keep uh, keep uh, answering my questions and keep the, keeping the information flowing to me, as well as to uh, Michael Hall, the director of the program, for uh, uh, taking for inviting me, but uh, but also taking this program to that next level. Um, it's very, very suited that we are hosting, that Gear Up is hosting today's program because actually Gear Up is an example of taking um, urban youth from the community and um, providing them with the support and the connections and the skill sets that they need to actually move up in their professional and career path. So thank you Gear Up for opening the doors. Um, I would also like to congratulate Charles 
James and Paul, the recipients of um, the leadership recognition tonight. And, um, and as Dr. Paul mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Development Partnerships and Community Engagement for the Providence Public Schools. He had asked me to keep you entertained for the last 20 minutes, for the next 20 minutes, so I will try to do my best to do that. Um, um, just let me share a, a piece of my background uh, besides what Dr. Paul mentioned. So I'm an um, immigrant um, from the Dominican Republic, um, and you can tell that because I have my accent. I came to the United States as an adult, um, 24, 25 years old, not knowing the language. Uh, came uh, being a professional in, back in my home country, uh, landed in a factory because uh, you know, that's the reality of many immigrants that come to the States looking for better opportunities, but one thing I knew is that that wasn't going to last. And so, so many years later, with um, my husband and my family, my two kids, uh, 13 and 16, um, I have, I, I try constantly to improve the community that I live, and to live by example. And so I take very to my heart the mantra of, um, if not now, when, if, not, if, if it is not you, then home. And so that's what I try to do with the work that I do both professionally and professionally. So having said all that, as I begin to um, talk about the work we do in Providence Public Schools and how we support distressed communities, um, I would like to pose a question to all of you. Uh, and I want you to just uh, sit on that question until the end when I'm going to, I'm planning to retake that question. Um, have you changed someone's life in the work that you do? Have you changed someone's life in the work that you do? Like I said, just think for a few seconds and I'm going to come back to that question at some point later. So Providence Public Schools, um, for many of you, may have an idea about what Providence Public Schools is. Many of you may not. And I have discovered, find out this, that while well, Providence Public Schools is the largest district in the state, uh, with uh, uh, the district that housed the largest elementary school in the region, in the Northeast region, not many people really know the diversity, the numbers behind the Providence Public Schools fabric the challenges and opportunities. So Providence Public Schools serves approximately 24,000 students. Um, and um, the families um, of those 24,000 students amount to about 17,000. We have 41 schools, elementary, middle, and high. We have thousands of employees who directly and indirectly support the work that we do, which is serving our students the students are the center of everything we do, and that's what the way it should be. A few more quick statistics for me to share with you about the district and the fabric of the community that we served is that 65% of our students are Latinos, 17 are black, and 5% are Asian. So you do the math and we served um, more than 90% diverse um, students. And their families. Almost 25%, almost 25% of the students um, are English language learners themselves or their families. And nearly 60% of our student population comes from homes where English is not their primary language. Combined, our students and their families speak 31 different languages and hail from approximately 52 different countries. Not only do many of our families face cultural and language differences, a majority face some incredible economic hardships at home. Most of our district, about 88% of the students qualify for free and reduced lunch. We are challenged daily 
with supporting families that are also homeless and of refugee status. That's kind of like the crisis that Dr. Ho was talking about and that I alluded to. Academic achievement gaps persist particularly among English language learners and students with disabilities. And you may be you know, asking you why I'm sharing all these statistics with you. So I'm sharing all of this with you not to simply state that our urban district faces challenges others may not. I'm sharing this with you so that you can help open the door to so many incredible new opportunities and further the success of our public schools. Each year at graduation night, we are touched and we are deeply touched by the stories of so many of our seniors and the unbelievable obstacles that they have to overcome to receive their degrees. There are stories of students living in refugee camps, losing their parents, living on their own, overcoming language barriers, and those who were told that they could never make to graduation now, and never mind to college. Despite their race, family's <clears throat> income, zip code, or history, each student shares one common thread, the opportunity for success in our schools and in society. Each day, our faculty, educators, staff, and community partners dedicate their, themselves to our students and supporting their achievement. From our teachers in the classroom, to school crisis teams that provide worth support to students overcoming all of those challenges. One thing is clear and consistent throughout the work that we do every day. It indeed takes a village. It indeed takes that village to see continued momentum and progress. Take, for example, our current efforts uh, to combat chronic absenteeism. This continues to be a major issue in our Providence Public Schools, and this is for so many reasons. Last school year, 35% of our students were chronically absent. And we know that if a student is not in school, the student is not learning what they need to do to be equipped to graduate college and career ready. It is clear that this is particularly harmful for our youngest students. And by tackling the problem early, we can help prevent them from falling behind. We have identified this as a problem and as a priority issue in our district and we are working very hard with the community partners that we have in the district, including city year and children and youth cabinet on a number of strategies to address this issue. In addition to that, this year we are making data on the school level available throughout the year to the schools so that they can take decisions within a timely manner. As we know, the school year flies, and it's very critical to provide the schools with the tools, the information, and the data they need to determine the progress that the students are making. In addition to our work to end chronic absenteeism, we have also launched an effort to prevent summer learning loss, which disproportionately affects low-income students and students of color in the public school system. And what did I say about the demographics? 90-some percent are minority students. As students at the greatest risk for summer learning loss can lose, listen to this, up to two years, two years of grade level reading and math ability by the time they, re they reach fifth grade. <clears throat> when you compare them with the other uh, students from higher income levels or households. In Providence, more than 60% of students suffer summer learning loss in reading and more than 51% in math. A student, a, a, um, a studies show and research that students from lower income families are far less likely to have access to summer learning opportunities which leads to greater summer learning loss and lower graduation rates. We have just recently formed a new summer task force 
which is led by, major, by the mayor's office. And I have the privilege to co-chair that um, task force, along with Jenny Johnson from City Gear. And we are gonna be working very diligently to identify opportunities to expand and enhance those opportunities that we are offering to our students during the summertime. We have definitely to think creatively and tapped into important partnerships to be sure that our students continue to have those learning opportunities that are so key to the ability of them to achieve success. I can tell you that I, I have been very impressed by the support and the work and the collaboration of so many partners in the community, um, more specifically with this work of, some of the task force of the summer learning loss. We have received support from United Way, Breakthrough Providence, AS220, YMCA, the Providence Public School Library, and the Rhode Island Foundation, just to name a few. In addition to all this, as a district, as an organization, and as a system, we have a fiduciary responsibility to allocate resources in a, in a smart and responsible way, making sure that the, every dollar that we allocate is bringing a return on investment and is aligned with the work that we are set to do, which is providing the opportunities and preparing our kids college and career ready. And speaking about return on investment, our families are a key element of that equation and they must be also part of the solution. Our responsibility is in finding ways to increase our family's capacity to aspire to do better to become agents of change in their kids' education. We have a responsibility to identify the barriers of engagement and to remove those barriers. And as part of this, we have expanded our English language classes for parents. We have also expanded our leadership training opportunities, and we are planning to provide additional family engagement support to the elementary schools where chronic absenteeism is more prevalent. And the plan is to do whatever it takes to get our students to a school every day. It is very clear that we are committed to helping our public schools succeed. As the largest public school district in Rhode Island, as I mentioned before, working hands-on with our schools and students has the potential to make a greater impact. Now, my goal is not just to stand before you and pretend that we have an easy path. Individually and collectively, we need to remind ourselves of the realities that our students face, as well as their families, which are behind those numbers that I shared with you at the beginning. When a student is acting up or when a parent is not showing up, at least not to the satisfaction of the adults in the community. We are at times very, very fast to jump to conclusions without accounting and attempting to address the so many variables and dynamics at place. And that's very counterproductive. To be more precise, some of these dynamics and the level of complexities extend beyond the school walls. We are talking about kids witnessing trauma, both at home and in the community. We are talking about substance and mental health issues that are not addressed. We are talking about a father or a mother absence from home because one of them is at jail, because one is dead, or because there is just one parent at home. We are talking about a student that is restless because he has slept in a sofa or in a car because they are homeless. We are talking about the lack of participation of, of students in the summer program, so in the after school program, to close that learning gap. But the truth of the matter is that they cannot attend to those programs because they have transportation issues or because they have to work during the summer to help mom and dad make their needs at home. We are talking about the student missing schools because health conditions, because they live in substandard conditions, exposed to lead, mold, and mildew, and many other environmental hazards. So that's the reality we face. 
And I hope that this helps to paint the picture that we face every day in our families and our students. And in order to support them the way that we should and must, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. Personally, I use an analogy that I learned some time ago and have served me very well, and it's a very simple. No matter how flat you make a pancake, it, it always has two sides, always. It doesn't matter how thin it is. And one of the greatest limitations we face as human beings is that we look at the world from our own limited perspective. You have to develop the ability to really see through another person's eyes. You will be tapping into an incredible, powerful potential. How can you influence other people if you cannot connect with them in a meaningful way? You impact when you understand someone's currency, feeling, and circumstances is immeasurable. That's why you always, always have to flip the pancake to see the other side. Now, speaking about impact, let me go back to that question I asked you at the beginning. Have you changed someone's life in the work that you do? Now, if you have not, I invite you to open yourself to that possibility. It is truly, truly transformational. And it's more transformational for the one that is giving than the one receiving. I have felt that transformation in the eyes of that student that through thought that he couldn't make it. I struggled painfully throughout the years, but was able to walk that stage on graduation day. I have seen it in the eyes and the words of gratitude of that mom that went to, the, uh, to learn English and then was able to communicate effectively with, with the teacher of her child. I have seen it in the eyes of that teacher that was appreciated by her colleagues and her students. I encourage you, as you continue to dive further into your professional careers, to think about so many, so many ways that you can share your knowledge, skill, and success. And as I like to say, time, talent, and treasure. So that you can help our Providence Public Schools, and by extension, you actually help the community, the city, and the state, and the nation that is so grateful with all of us. And that can become in a form of volunteering, tutoring, offering internships, opportunities for our students, donating resources, the opportunities are endless. Please become involved, invested in the well-being of our students. And remember, in the larger school system in the state. And hopefully, hopefully one day, one of the students that you help guide and support will stand be behind you and behind this podium, providing words of wisdom to you and to the next generation. I would like to thank you all for this opportunity and I look forward to working with all of you to help Providence become a better place. Thank you. And nominated for Gringo of the Year in Texas. <laughs> 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 and, and, and Mr. Boschman says I speak Spanglish. <laughs> oh, I didn't use that term. <laughs> I wouldn't even call it that. <clears throat> Questions for our guest. As you can see, we have a diverse audience. Um, in working with the diversity of the community, given the problems that you have described to us, what special skills do you think are necessary to work across this kind of diversity and the other diversity that's in the community and kind of work, work on those problems with the children you're talking about? I will say that at the top of that list is being compassion. And um, so being compassion entails putting yourself in, the, in that place of the other person. Uh, and 
and um, and when you do that, you actually uh, start understanding, beginning to understand the realities that the community and the students' population faces, um, and. Um, And at times, it may, it may look like uh, very overwhelming and very uh, discouraging. But if you keep reminding yourself that this nation will be, if it's actually a nation of uh, people from different backgrounds and experiences that coming together make the fabric we are, and by that diversity, we become stronger. Um, I think that you are better able to equip yourself to um, to understand the community and to serve them. And um, instead of pointing fingers, which is what at times we resort to, um, uh, it becomes more of a human level connection and you are able to see through the values and the contributions of families and people across the board. So again, I will say that being compassionate because that's what allows you to place yourself in, the, in other um, individuals to choose. And you work building Partnerships, formal partnerships in the community, right? Right. What kinds of characteristics do you look for? So I briefly alluded to that piece um, when I talked about return on investment. So what, what ended up happening over the years, right? So there is so much need in Providence and so many opportunities. Every time I talked about need, I always talked about opportunities um, because I see one very connected to the other. We've, we fall into the trap of thinking that every single person coming to the door or every single organization that would like to help is actually helping us to move the needle. And we know uh, if we apply the concept of um, organizational structure and the business, the pure business concept, that's not true. Things needs to be aligned to the work that you do. And so, Engaging in a partnership just because of the sake of putting something on a paper is meaningless. At the end of the day, if it's not providing the support that families, students, and teachers and faculty need to move that needle. So we are really making sure that we, number one, we are conducting a scan of all the partnerships that we have to determine if uh, the partners that we have are the right partners to have and to move, right, because this is a collaboration and it's about giving and taking. That's what a partnership is. There needs to be something in it for both parties to be in a partnership for it to work. And so we are gonna be engaging in that difficult discussion with the partners that we have to make sure that partners are aligned to the work that we are trying to achieve. And, um, and as we are looking to expand and to strengthen, we are doing so through those lenses. Um, one thing that is clear, and it's been clear uh, uh, matter of discussion, is that not only the Providence Public Schools, but the city is facing a very financial, uh, very difficult financial challenges. And so the dollars that we have on the table to engage in partnerships that entails a procurement process, meaning that we are paying for the services to be provided are not many. So we are more than ever depending upon um, the good heart of the people in the community. Um, and by people in the community, I'm talking about individuals, but I'm also talking about businesses, organizations, corporations, colleges and universities to actually do what is right for the people of the city and the state. But we are also trying to change the dynamic and to talk about the business proposition, which is that as, and we have heard this, as goes the capital, so goes the state. And the fact that we, we need to come together to prepare the workforce that we need with the skill set that we need. And at the, at the end, and I, I think that we were talking about this, so it's making the connection, right? So at the end of the day, the a workforce that is skilled is the one that is going to increase the tax base. And so this notion that investing in schools and public education may be a waste of dollars, really we need to think that through. 
because by actually investing in education, we are actually making the connection um, long term to all those issues that I talked about when you talked about community development. So the more disposable income that people are able to generate, the more likely they will be, they will not be living in substandard conditions. The more likely they will be able to afford opportunities uh, for their kids. And, and at times, really at times, the only, I'm not gonna say the only difference because that will be deceiving, but one of the biggest differences between a kid in an urban community and a kid in a non-urban community are the opportunities that are afforded to them within and after school. And we are all responsible for making it that happen. And so it goes beyond, like I said before, it goes, it goes way beyond just the walls of the schools, because we all contribute to creating those conditions. And we also know that the subject is the result of the, his or her environment. And so to an extent, we all contribute to um, all these challenges. And so it's, a, it's incumbent upon each one of us to contribute to changing that and to make the connections because uh, it, we tend to point fingers and is that the educational system is so awful, let me look this other way. But the, and there are other opportunities which are not detracting um, or speaking against, but the reality is that at the end of the day, public education, traditional public education is the way that the masses are educated. And that will continue to be the case until we figure something out. So if that's the case, let's own it and let's invest so that we can achieve the results that we need. I noted in this uh, morning's Providence Journal that the mayor announces a new community development project where he's going to rehabilitate houses. Mm -hmm. Will that be a help, a hindrance, or totally neutral to the way we're trying to do? Actually, it's a, it's a tremendous help. Like I said, one of the so one of the indicators for poor performance in school is living in substandard conditions. We know that asthma is the highest uh, reason why uh, students in urban communities miss schools, uh, health related, right? And so asthma is um, triggered by those substandard conditions. So addressing the housing um, uh, realities of um, the city definitely is a contributor to improving those conditions. And so that's the way that I think we should be looking at all the issues that we have in our society instead of uh, trying to divide and say education is the only, uh, housing should be the only, healthcare access should be the only. No, because one cannot coexist without the other without addressing the other. So definitely, I think that is a help. Glad to hear it. Good. Other questions for Ms. Yes. Maybe just an example, um, because you, you spoke about the importance of corporate partnerships. And I love what you said about time, talent, and treasure. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most rewarding programs that I've participated in through my company is the, it used to be called VIPS, Inspiring mm -hmm. Minds, uh, the Power Lunch Program, yeah. where we just ask, you know, co-workers to give up a one lunch break a week and go read with children in one of the Providence Elementary Schools. So, um, Dr. Hall always says, you know, not all leaders are managers, and I'm not a manager in my organization, but I negotiated hard enough to organize a team of volunteers. And when you asked your first question about affecting someone else's life and making an impact. That's exactly the group of children that popped into my mind. And it was zero dollars. That was, just, you know, financially, other than, well, maybe some, you know, people went a little bit over in their lunch times and didn't, you know, but it, it made a huge impact in, in my mind. And then one of the other mention, what things that you mentioned was truancy issues. And one of the little bitty programs that I get to be a part of at AAA, which is the company I work for, is School Safety Patrol. And we train student leaders, because it's really a safety and leadership mm -hmm. program, to help lead walking school buses to school, mm -hmm. to help in neighborhoods where you know parents were perceiving the neighborhood as maybe not so safe to allow their children to walk alone, but yet because of 
work schedules or other issues were able to, to take their, you know, transport their children to school themselves. So just a little tiny piece of what my company was able to contribute, and I felt both programs made a big impact. So. And I'm glad that you were mentioning those two programs because um, sometimes people may think that their time is not valued or that perhaps is so insignificant that little program um, I can tell you that um, the volunteers that come through the power lunch mm -hmm. um, through um, what it was inspired minds and um, uh, peps right yes. volunteers yes. in Providence and now inspired minds is, is transformational um, we have um, leaders in their own right coming to read to the students and so it really opens the world of opportunities and, and wonder to the kids. Um, it, it establishes relationships and connections that otherwise the students may not have. Um, so also with, um, you know, with that of the program, the reality is that we um, and we are not necessarily so way different than any other urban communities, not only in the state, but across the nation. So we have walkability issues um, in the city. Uh, we have, uh, we are not a pedestrian friendly city in many areas. Um, safety and crime, perceived or not, is an issue. And so um, research shows that um, Chronic absenteeism is more prevalent in elementary grades, um, K through three grade, K through third grade, and so what happened is that again going back to all those challenges, so mom or dad may have a job and they have to be at their job at 6 a.m. The only way for that kid to go to school is walking a distance that that adult at home may not feel that is safe, and so. If I don't have an adult that I can rely, rely on to send that child to school, more likely the child is going to stay home. Or it's going to be, to, it's going to be arriving to school late until that other sibling that may have a later uh, beginning time, right, and a later bell time, goes to school and take that child to school because of those conditions. And so we have been able to work with soul partners like Family Service of Rhode Island, uh, who has been able to recruit and uh, manage um, hundreds of volunteers throughout the year to uh, imaginary creating a, a bus, right? And so it's actually people walking through the neighborhoods, uh, picking up kids at their doorsteps in their home and walking them to school. And that happens mornings and afternoons in a handful of schools that we have. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because again, those are many creative ways that we have used to tap into resources and trying to address the needs that we see. Again, to make sure that <coughs> students get to school every day and that we prepare them college and career ready. So thank you for that. Anything else? We thank you, oh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, away from your family, all your other responsibilities to be with us, and we benefit. They from must be here. texting mom already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Thank you. We certainly can't to have someone like uh, Doris to be with us tonight, and uh, I look forward to being able to put together two more programs this year um, with equally spectacular uh, speakers. So. Mark your calendars for March 2 and May 4. And if anybody wants to join me over at uh, 205 150 Washington Street for a tutoring session, questions about classes, I'll be over there in a few moments. And help yourselves to some more refreshments before you leave. Um, because I only have a limited number of freezer bags to eat. <laughs> so thank you for coming, and uh, if you haven't signed in, be sure you do that so we can uh, get this uh, thing here. Thank you. Good night, Ms. Janica.